بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم جود مورنينج ايفريبادي ات از ماي اونر تو ويلكم اول اوف يو ان ذا اور 11th انيوال ان شمس يونيفرستي انترناشونال كونفرنس اي ام دكتور ياسر مصطفى بروفيسور اوف بالمونري ميديسين اند اكس تشير بيرسون اوف تشيست ديزيز ان شمس يونيفرستي ات از ماي اونر اولسو تو Uh, co-chair uh, this session uh, with uh, eminent professors, Dr. Uh, my uh, professor, Dr. Muhammad Awad-Tagiddin, the uh, ex-minister of health and the consultant of the president. Uh, also, I chair with uh, Professor Sami Abdu, uh, professor of clinical pathology. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Rachel Tanner. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Ahmed Salman, uh, the senior immunologist, vaccinologist, PI and SRF manager at uh, General Institute, fellow and advisor at uh, Kellogg College, University of Oxford, UK, and visiting professor at Enchamps University, Egypt. He will uh, give us a talk about uh, reshaping the future of global health through the swift development of vaccines from traditional preventive vaccines to therapeutic personalized cancer vaccines and more. Very interesting topic, Dr. Salman. We are waiting. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Yasser and all the panel. Thank you so much for that indeed. It's really my great pleasure to be with you here, of course, uh, nothing better than being recognized by home. And um, I have been uh, here in Ain Shams University doing my undergrad in the biochemistry department. And um, yeah, so I have a special um, like place in my heart to come back here and give uh, a talk. Um, so I will start, of course, by acknowledging and thanking uh, the invitation uh, that happened by the president of Ain Shams University, Professor Mahmoud Al-Mitini, and his vice president, uh, Dr. Ayman Saleh. So it's really a great pleasure to join here. And also thank you so much to the whole Jenner team for accepting the invitation to join us uh, for two days to give the talks for different uh, fields of vaccine and uh, immune therapy for um, different uh, type of diseases and cancer uh, vaccines as well. So yeah, that's my um, department, uh, biochemistry department in uh, Ain Shams University in uh, Faculty of Science. So this is where I did my um, undergrad and my master. And uh, we currently based at the Jenner Institute. Um, and the name on behalf of uh, a physician, Edward Jenner, that who the father of vaccinology based on understanding or thinking about the idea how you can generate some protection based on exposing the body or the immune system to uh, something from a pathogen or a virus or a bacteria that might generate a memory to make it possible to respond faster and protect uh, the person against the real infection. And um, that was against one of the very serious uh, viral infections, smallpox, that actually killed over half a billion uh, person in the last century. So um, with uh, the vaccine um, intervention, it was possible to control and actually eradicate um, smallpox completely. And that has been announced in 1980. So we're based here at the General Institute, which is um, um, a very modern building, but actually we're based on Oxford University, which is over than 800 years old. And uh, we um, kind of mixing between the cutting edge technologies in, in our institute, but keeping the history um, of, um, of uh, education and the University of Oxford. And um, Oxford University is more really dedicated for medical science and um, uh, medical research. So 70% of the um, uh, University of Oxford is actually dedicated for uh, medical research. So vaccine development and manufacturing is always um, a bit tricky to really like work in, in vaccine field because it's a very long uh, term and high cost investment and is also um, um, 
um, like takes very long time. So there's always not too much companies or researchers love to work on vaccines because of the high risk also of failure at the end. Although it have a very direct impact globally, and I think there's nothing better to uh, like highlight that than uh, the COVID pandemic over the last few years. So it's also a matter of national security because you're not sure really if uh, that infection might come from natural resource or from something else. So it's very important to support academic and scientists and the research and developments and facilitate the coordination, not just between the, the universities or academia, but also the whole supply chain. You need to make a good link between industry, research, and uh, marketing and legalizing bodies because it's impossible to just move from bench to um, a product at the end without that direct collaboration and interaction between different bodies. And that's what makes it really hard for something like vaccine developments. And that would make it possible during the pandemic for um, um, our group in Oxford to be able to develop faster with developing a vaccine in less than a year. It's also very important to consider always the public engagements because think about it, if you make a vaccine and then you come eventually trying to look for volunteers or people to take the vaccines and if they refuse to contribute, you actually did nothing. So it's very important to engage the public and make them interesting and understand how it is very valuable to um, be involved directly, either by funding or even by themselves to contribute as a volunteers into clinical trials and of course to accept taking the vaccine uh, afterwards. And you need uh, the um, um, infrastructure and of course, smash bureaucracy. So uh, vaccine development, it's a very, very long process. Ideally, based on what we used to hear, it takes more than 15 years as an average. And that's because you have to go through different steps. But in fact, the, the long process, it's not because of the research. And that was very, very obvious over the pandemic you really need to go through different legalization steps and through the regulatory um, and like publishing papers, getting funding, and that actually would take most of the time. So you could actually generate some good data, but then moving from preclinical to clinical trials, it might take you two, three, maybe five years till you publish your data and secure a, a large funding to move to clinical trials, and that would be a large gap. So that was not there over the pandemic, it was possible to develop the vaccine, um, many, many vaccines actually, not just Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in less than a year, but actually there were many other vaccines was possible to be ready within less than a year by just cutting these waiting uh, time and uh, bureaucracy and uh, getting approvals from regulatory or funding. So it is possible to do uh, vaccines uh, without um, affecting the actual scientific or safety um, uh, steps is if you make all these links and this is what we try to establish either with um, collaborations or even we did that through different um, cooperations between academia between industry between funders between governments between legalizing bodies that's going to make it possible to proceed faster people always and that includes me when I started working on vaccine developments that you make vaccines against disease, like parasites, bacteria, uh, viruses. But uh, microbes are around us, and they actually, we carry in our body more um, uh, bacteria than our actual cells. But these are the traditional vaccines, and this is what like you put in your mind when you hear about vaccine at the beginning. But I will leave that for the talks. Um, you can actually develop vaccines against any things um, like have protein structure. And that could be either like disease, like chronic diseases, like heart disease, um, Alzheimer, cancer. I mean, we leave this talks for the, um, the, like the untraditional vaccines. Adult Tarabi will give his talk tomorrow. And they actually changed my like thinking about vaccines when I started to listen to their talks. They try to make like vaccines against addictions, against nicotine, against against everything basically. So it's not just uh, viruses and bacteria and, and um, um, like uh, pathogens or diseases, but you can actually direct the immune system 
to whatever a target that you need to destroy or control through antibodies or other component of the immune system. And even you can generate a memory. And as example, in cancer vaccines, they could be therapeutic and they are very, very efficient uh, compared to any other uh, way of treating cancers because they reduce the uh, recurrency, uh, the current, the recurrence uh, chance because they build memory, which is not in any treatment. Um, so that will will avoid actually um, uh, the cancer uh, recurrence. Uh, there's of course different platforms to generate vaccines, and maybe by uh, like I'll just take or highlight some of them. But over the talks from the general groups, they will give like more details about some vaccines we're already having and we're testing in different stages, either preclinically or in clinical stages, and how we basically use the technology to direct the immune system to target, um, as I mentioned, either for traditional target as um, infectious disease or um, like untraditional um, targets like cancers or therapeutic vaccines. Of course, the most um, common um, and traditional way of making vaccine is the whole organism vaccine, either killed or irradiated or um, like genetically attenuated. And Boldin going to give uh, a talk about malaria later in this session about how they develop malaria vaccine using this technology, which is also very efficient in, in, in some uh, uh, pathogens or diseases. The other um, way we used to use like DNA in the past, although there's no licensed vaccine for DNA, now of course RNA is taking over. So using the mRNA vaccines will be um, opening um, a wide era about different applications. Uh, when I start hearing like over 10 then years ago um, about mRNA vaccines was mainly for treating cancers, but now it can be used as a vaccine against infectious disease and of course it's proved uh, their efficiency um, over the pandemic and Cesar is going to give us uh, a talk later about mRNA vaccines uh, tomorrow who's leading the mRNA vaccine um, uh, unit in, in General Institute. Um, another technology is the viral vectors. Uh, there's many different viral vectors. And of course, um, over the pandemic, uh, using the chimpanzee adenovirus or the adenovirus, like uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So there's a different licensed vaccine using that technology. And it's very efficient technology um, and very easy to produce and it's very stable in terms of like um, off-shelf um, half-life and stability. And that was the AstraZeneca vaccine as example. And we use it for cancer immunotherapy. Um, so Eli Barn tomorrow will give a talk about uh, hepatitis C vaccines using the technology as a therapeutic vaccine as well. Um, Protein-based, there's of course different forms of protein. Um, I would even highlight some work related to that and there will be more talks about the malaria, our successive, a successful vaccine, which has um, got actually um, licensed in some countries now. So using the virus-like particle technology, which is uh, very efficient in inducing um, antibody or B cells, and of course can induce a little bit T cells, but it's very, very efficient in inducing high titer of neutralizing antibodies, and that could be um, an, a key uh, need for developing uh, some vaccines, and I'll highlight um, some applications for that later. And during pandemics, you not just consider um, uh, the efficacy of your vaccines, you need to consider different factors. If you need billions of doses of vaccine over pandemic or for a disease that's widely distributed, you need to consider that how easily you were manufactures that, the supply, um, of course, the stability, how you can distribute it to areas, far areas with um, like hot temperature or uh, high temperatures, how you basically will produce it in, in, in a low cost or cheap manufacturing cost, because you need billions and billions of, of these doses. And um, as example for the malaria, because it's mainly in low income countries, that's a key factor. So if you make an efficient vaccine, and it's working perfectly, but it's very high in cost, you might struggle to get it licensed in, in low-income countries in Africa. So you need to consider all these factors, and um, not just, of course, uh, the efficacy, and of course, as a key thing, safety first for vaccines. So my favorite, and actually when I started doing my DPhil or PhD degree in Oxford, 
um, over 13 years ago that was working mainly on malaria. Before that, I was doing TB work um, at Ain Shams University with uh, my supervisors here. One of them is Professor Abdul Rahman uh, from the biochemistry department. So um, then switched to malaria, and um, I was like thinking uh, it should be like. Um, um, I was not hearing a lot about malaria at that time. And then you hear that people struggling for over than 100 years to make vaccine for malaria, and there were no licensed vaccine at that time. Until to date, just started to get some efficient vaccine, including our vaccines from the General Institute. So it's, it's a very challenging parasite, and you really need a very strong immune response to handle that parasite. I mean, I always say that, like, uh, for COVID, as example, it's a virus made of, like, 11 or 13 proteins. And when you need a certain titer of antibodies or immune response, that actually is like stopping bike comparing to stopping parasite, uh, like malaria having 5,500 proteins is like stopping a ship. So you need really strong immune response and very efficient neutralizing antibodies. Otherwise, you cannot stop that uh, parasite from... Um, causing the infection. Uh, we work mainly, there's different groups in our lab uh, dealing with malaria, but the most successful uh, vaccine at the moment is the pre orthrocytic vaccine, which is trying to stop the malaria as a sporozoid before infecting the liver. So um, it starts, of course, malaria by a mosquito bite. Um, uh, then uh, the mosquito, during um, like taking the blood meal, they have to inject some like kind of um, anticoagulants, and then with that, they inject some sporozoid. They, within a few minutes, um, travel uh, to the liver, stay in the liver, grow to, uh, for like few days, around nine days, and then each single sporozoid after the liver stage become 40,000 uh, liver merozoid. And then every two days, when it started the blood stage, every two days, every blood merozoid turned to 48 Mirozoids, um, so then the number goes more than exponential rate, and that makes the number really hard to control. And then, if another um, a mosquito take a meal from infected person, they will take the gametes, and the gametes will fertilize into the mosquitoes, generating infectious sporozoid that migrate to the salivary glands and then complete the cycle. So we find it more efficient to stop the malaria in um, the sporozoid stage before getting into the liver. And that's actually the vaccines currently um, licensed or having partial license, R21. And that's because when the mosquito um, make the, the injection, it's like ideally between 100 to 500 sporozoids. So maybe it's possible at that stage to control the numbers. Um, we had some problems in the preclinical groups to basically test human malaria vaccines. And that has been uh, partially solved by our collaborations with my second lab over my PhD in Leiden. Uh, Blundin is going to give her talk later today. And they are a master lab in gene editing and molecular biology. So human malaria cannot infect mice. And that's make it, or even small animals, so you cannot really test vaccines preclinically easily in animal model. And that's a very challenging thing. So you cannot really make a vaccine and then know how that's going to protect. We used to rely on neutralizing antibodies and blocking assays and neutralizing assays. But that's never like efficient 100%. And then having a whole parasite, having the whole life cycle to see how that will interact with the whole immune system, it's more efficient. And the way to go with that is making a transgenic parasite. So the whole idea is that there is mice malaria that can infect mice, which is cannot infect human, or maybe partially can infect human, but then they will be arrested in the liver to be more accurate. And there's human malaria that cannot infect mice or small animals. So we used to target a specific antigen, let's say the surface protein of um, like the sporozoid, CSP. So then we make transgenic parasites in the rodent malaria, expressing the human antigen there. And then you knock out or you remove the gene from uh, the rodent malaria and you replace it with the human malaria. So then you end up with malaria can infect mice, but carry the specific protein or antigen from the human malaria. And that's, you can use it as a challenge model. So then you vaccinate mice, especially if you use humanized mice, 
um, as example, some mice strain expressing human antibodies like KMAP mice, and then you challenge them with these transgenic expressing the exact target from human malaria, and then you can see how that uh, will uh, be either um, like um, um, in efficacy uh, challenge then if you can stop the parasite in that case or the parasite can cause the infection. So that's the first photo I made during my PhD to have a special uh, time. Um, so then we, we, we had actually different technologies as I mentioned earlier and we tried to use um, viral vector like adeno and MVA uh, using protein, using virus-like particle and recently there's some work to work in uh, mRNA vaccines for malaria but we found it more successful to rely in targeting the pre-arthrocytic stage and inducing a massive titer of antibodies and the best technology out of these three uh, were virus-like particle, which is you decorating an empty capsid of, of like a virus based on just the surface pro, uh, protein of a virus, and then you make like an empty capsid, and then that will be decorated with your target protein, and that's with an adjuvant, with using um, adjuvants, it can induce a massive immune response. So um, we use, uh, like there's different way to make um, VLBs, but there's um, the way we use for R21, that's using yeast expression system. And we use the hepatitis B surface antigen to fuse it with uh, the malaria antigen. So um, then you can express um, like high um, amount or high concentration, you can get a very good yield of your target and then you can basically, um, that will facilitate the manufacturing process and also induce um, a, a massive titer of antibodies. So um, from maybe 40 years ago, GSK started to work using that technology to develop their own vaccine, RTSS. And that was by using um, one, um, like ratio one to three out of um, hepatitis B surface antigen, three copies compared to one copy of the malaria antigen. And that's make the density of the target um, uh, peptide or protein on the surface uh, are much less. So um, we made an improved version, we call it R21, and in that uh, version that made by Cat Colin, started working that in 2013, um, using uh, the exact same ratio from hepatitis B surface antigen and uh, CSP, and that will allow to have one-to-one -one ratio from the malaria antigen to the hepatitis B surface antigen. So that uh, will make it um, more uh, or higher density of uh, the, the malaria antigen on the surface, and that's, we saw it based on clinical trials that will be expressed, um, uh, that will be presented later by uh, Lisa in the next talk, uh, how that's uh, performed very well in clinical trials compared to RTSS, and now it's the, the leading malaria vaccines um, inducing over 80% protection in clinical trials, and there's no other vaccines can uh, so far reach that um, uh, level. So the only two vaccines that got um, our recommendations and they are partially licensed in different countries is uh, GSK RTSS, um, but I will leave that part to, um, to Lisa and to Adrian tomorrow. And their efficacy ranged from 35% up to 60%, but R21 inducing over 75% to 82%. And in addition to that, because considering the other factors, not just the efficacy, which is the manufacturing abilities and uh, the cost, that make R21 possible to reproduce in larger scale, and that's make it like um, a game changer, because um, as example, GSK can produce annually six millions to 10 million dose, but something like R21, we can produce between 300 to 500 million doses annually uh, through uh, the collaboration with uh, Serum Institute of India. Um, there were lots of applications for using the transgenic parasites to actually test other antigens and other vaccines and to be able to even desire the clinical trials. So um, we had lots of um, um, experiments to try to see what is the adjusted dose to use in mice and then replicate that in human using the best adjuvants. So um, I'm highlighting here more about uh, the rationale about 
thinking how to design a vaccines and then to kind of assess that to be able to move from the clinical or from the bench and the design and choosing the, the exact technology that could be the target or the most efficient technology to move forward to preclinical and um, clinical from preclinical to clinical stages. So just here highlighting um, some key uh, differences between um, the only two uh, vaccines that are now partially licensed for use. And um, I should maybe um, mention that earlier. So the malaria uh, parasite infects nearly 250 million people annually. And um, most of uh, the death, which is over 640,000 in 2020, uh, which is, was actually double uh, the, the death number or mortality rate for COVID in Africa, um, that's actually um, happen almost every year, and that's uh, mainly from children under five years old. So it's very important to, um, to uh, develop a malaria vaccines um, to save millions and millions of lives. And developing the, the, the technology um, using virus-like particles, it's, it's very efficient technology to uh, stop the parasites before invading the liver, which is mainly um, when the parasite is extracellularly before infecting the hepatocytes, it really needs a high titer of antibodies. So using VLB is now is, is the most efficient technology, but we are open to investigate other technologies as using mRNA um, in, in the recent days as well. And then that's allow you to test uh, your vaccine preclinically in different mice strains, including recently some humanized mice that can express human antibodies in mice, and that will give you a better read to be able to uh, take that forward to clinical trials. Um, that's from uh, the progress in the last year, from um, two years ago now. It's from uh, phase two clinical trials. And then recently, we had um, uh, R21 vaccines getting partial uh, approval to be in use in two African countries, in, um, in, in Ghana and um, Uganda. And uh, uh, there will be, of course, uh, other uh, paperwork through the licensure and going through the regulatory to get the approval from the WHO to hopefully use it worldwide. But I will leave that part for Adrian uh, talk tomorrow. So it's, it's very, very important, again, to consider the other factors, not just the efficacy of a vaccines. The cost is a key thing, especially when it's required in a large scale and in low-income countries like malaria. And the amount and the stability of the vaccines, so uh, that was also obvious over the pandemic uh, for having very, very efficient vaccines like mRNA, although there were the funding to buy it, but stability was an issue at the beginning because it needs to be stored in minus 80 degrees or at least minus 20 degrees. So that's make it a little bit challenging. But then considering that something like malaria in hot African countries, you really need uh, some good stability for your, your vaccines at high temperatures. You need to be at low cost. You need to be able to produce um, a massive amount of, of the vaccines to be able to vaccinate a whole country or different countries in Africa. And that's um, well uh, considered for R21. Uh, based on making uh, the collaborations with Serum Institute of India, it's easily possible to produce over 200 to 300 million doses annually compared to RTSS, which is um, struggling to make 10 to 15 million um, um, doses a year. Um, I'll stop here because I will leave the actual data and talks to um, um, other colleagues from the Jenner. They're going to cover um, the massive range of um, different technologies, some results about vaccines and tuberculosis and uh, cancer vaccines uh, for Bernatoque or using adjuvants for Galbustoque uh, later today in the second session. And of course, I would thank, uh, that, that's of course a team uh, work and massive efforts from lots of scientists either in Oxford or our collaborators in, in different countries worldwide. And of course, thousands and thousands of volunteers who basically dedicate their times to, to take part in this. And would like to thank Professor Mahmoud al Maitaini for, for basically making the link with Ayn Shams and visiting us at the General Institute and inviting us to this conference. So we need more of these moves to basically be able to um, cooperate and link different um, academic 
uh, efforts and again with, with other event partners from industry and regulatories to basically be able to move forward and establish um, like um, a good ability to, to be like a hub uh, in the Middle East for vaccine development, either in Ancients or, or Egypt. And uh, thank you so much for your um, time and for attending this talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. by your presence and thank you for that. Thank you so much. Uh, back to your presentation, you mentioned that uh, pre-COVID-19, it always takes 15 years to develop a new vaccine. At least. And post, at least. And post-COVID is just less than a year. Do you think that we broke all the rules of regulation and uh, experimental and uh, analyzing of producing a vaccine for good, or this will be uh, just an exception are we, and we will get back to our uh, strategy? Okay, now th there's actually the optimistic things, and that's what we were thinking. It's getting better, definitely, to, to deal with the regulatory, especially with now having a form and be, at least understanding the process, but we're not really going at any uh, thing closer to COVID in, in, in any other disease. Like, we thought that maybe after COVID, things will go amazingly, that you get the same way of funding, the same way of... Uh, like regulatory approvals and so on. And yeah, I'll, I'll take the example of malaria. So malaria uh, killed double the, the, the number in 2020 in African children. So it's killed 640,000. COVID killed in 2020 300,000 people in Africa. And we still struggle to get it approved, although we work on that for nearly 13, 14 years. And it doesn't go the same way, uh, sadly, when it's a, a, like a world or global pandemic or taking it through other disease. So we're hoping that will be in consideration, but in real life, it's better than before, but not as what you hope. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for this nice comprehensive presentation, which is very, very interesting for us. As you know, as you have mentioned in your lectures, there's a lot of challenges regarding vaccine development, starting from selecting the epitope, safety profile, cytotoxicity, preclinical, clinical, and all these uh, issues are very, very uh, crucial for the vaccine development. Uh, and based on the, our history with COVID-19, we need to take some steps in Egypt here. We have a lot of personnel, uh, we have some facilities, good facilities. Uh, my question is, based on your history and your uh, experience in this field, how can we implement or take some steps to make a nucleus for vaccine development in Egypt? Because this is very, very critical issues for the national security and for the, for the national health in Egypt. So, in your opinion, how can we proceed with this uh, direction? based on your experience. Thank you so much. That, that's a key question, really. And um, I think if I will highlight the most challenging problem, I would say um, regulatory process and bureaucracy. I think we don't have any problem with like scientists or academic efforts. It's always there. And it's very, very like high profile and very good yield uh, from like research based. Funding is not always an issue because once you make a good product, you could easily get funding either internally or externally. So that can be still sorted, although there's of course some issues with the funding. But what actually make it harder is always getting the approvals and the regulatories and the bureaucracy of moving forward from bench to a product and losing the link between industry and uh, basically academia and research. So if, if that's, Will, will, will get sorted. And I think there's lots of effort to do that, but I think we need more effort to be able to progress as what we hope to be like competing globally in, in the same things. Because the Middle East area in Africa is kind of empty. There's no manufacturing facility. Now recently there will be, but there were no, as example, like lots of research 
for vaccines or clinical trials or anything happen over the last uh, like years in the pandemic. So who will basically put the effort will lead on that. So in Egypt, there's lots of like pharma companies and there's lots of like specialized scientists and they have all the qualification requires and just giving them the required supports definitely will just get uh, like Egypt as the center for that. And yeah, I always say that after the pandemic, the whole area started to wake up. So who will start first and what the required efforts gonna take the lead. And yeah, we have better chance, but we have to do some effort in that direction. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and thanks to uh, the kind invitation. Uh, I'm representing VBC, Vaccines and Biotechnology City. This is a new manufacturing site to produce vaccines in Egypt. And here we are focusing on the strategic objective of uh, producing the vaccine to the country. Uh, working in the industry for almost 18 years, we can feel the gap between the research and doing it in the labs, going for the manufacturing process and the, the, the challenges with the manufacturing, starting from the assembly of the, 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 the valencies and doing the other steps of the manufacturing, and finally reaching to the clinic, which will, may take almost 15 years, as you discussed in the, in the past. Uh, our interest now is to work with you rather than working in silos. We are highly interested in bridging the gap between all those different steps. Uh, so how, how you can find the role of the manufacturers in supporting this industry and what we can do for you. Okay, Thank well. you. That's, that's great to hear. And we know there's always an interest, but I, again, I think having the, the gap is in, in regulation. Actually, that will be highlighted um, like massively tomorrow in Adrian talk because uh, he have been through this over the last many years working in vaccines. And now in our institute, we are able to kind of make that link and, and move faster from bench to clinical trials to industry. So he, he definitely will cover that tomorrow in details. But I think getting the support at least uh, financially uh, from uh, pharma companies to academia to give all the supports like to give the fundings and so on to to move faster in, in the preclinical or the bench work that's the key things at least you will overcome the struggle about the funding because there, there's different factors of course like the regulation is the key things which is I think slow up everything in all the stages but at least the funding is there like there's, there's an issue about funding and about also um, arranging directly or making training for the, like the students. So then there's always this gap between what you study in, in college or academia and then when you go to real life research might be not covering everything in real life. So maybe doing like lots of training programs that will help as well and the funding for the researchers and then being present directly, removing any gaps between academia and research institutes and of course trying to go together to put like protocols with the regulatory bodies to facilitate then getting things as clinical trials product and then moving forwards and so on. That, that's my suggestion. But yeah, taking at least one step at a time should be very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So it's a pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Lisa Stockdale. So Lisa previously worked in small molecule drug development and then completed a master's and PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she then went on to work in vaccine development for TB, typhoid, COVID-19 and malaria. So today she's going to talk to us about R21 clinical development and immunology for a malaria vaccine. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Thank you all for coming along. 
So as Rachel introduced, I'm going to give you an overview of R21 clinical development and immunology. And thanks to Ahmed for giving a great introduction on R21. Okay, as Ahmed touched on, the need for a malaria vaccine is great. There were 247 million cases worldwide in 2021, and that's an increase on the two previous years, and that's probably due to um, the COVID pandemic and the lack of availability of resources. The deaths from malaria in 2020 stood at 619,000 and that's an estimated 47,000 additional deaths over 2019. Over 70% of the global malaria deaths are concentrated in 10 countries, and the majority of those are WHO Africa region and India. The majority of deaths are in children under five, and although recent advances in seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis have helped to reduce the rate of malaria, um, we do see uh, still this enormous mortality associated with malaria. The costs associated are huge. Uh, approximately $117 billion in lost productivity and school days, especially for those children under five who are most affected by malaria. So despite this huge need and despite malaria being a huge problem, much bigger than COVID, uh, we've seen a declining R&D investment in malaria uh, research. So as was touched upon before, there are various different strategies to getting a malaria vaccine. So as Ahmed uh, showed, the malaria life cycle is complicated, but that gives us multiple different angles to attack the, the parasite. So with R21, we are attacking the form of the sporozoite. So this is where the mosquito bites the person and injects this form into the, into the person. There are other groups within Oxford developing vaccines against the blood stage, which is further along in the cycle. You have many, many more parasites in the system to deal with. So it's a much harder problem. And then there's also another group dealing with transmission blocking vaccines, which I think is absolutely amazing, this technology. It's where the mosquito bites a person, takes up antibodies specific to a form of the parasite that the human will never see, and it attacks the form of the parasite inside the mosquito itself. So all of these are happening in Oxford at the moment, um, but ours is the pre-erythrocytic uh, stage and uh, focusing on the sporozoite form. So the WHO have set a target of 75% vaccine efficacy as their target product profile in the target population. So I don't think that I need to spend very much time on this. RTSS is the only, at the moment, WHO pre-qualified malaria vaccine. It was pre-qualified last year and is still waiting to be rolled out in, um, in high endemicity countries in sub-Saharan Africa. R21 is uh, being uh, reviewed by WHO and should, fingers crossed, be pre-qualified uh, by the end of this year, but has already been approved for use in two African countries, Ghana and Nigeria. So we can see the differences here, RTSS on the left and R21 on the right, as Ahmed already presented. And R21 has a much higher proportion of this CSP, this circumsporozoite protein, on the surface of the virus-like particle. And the idea being that this will present to the body a much higher density of this uh, antigen, and the likelihood will be that we will be able to produce more and higher quality antibodies against R21 in comparison to RTSS. It's also got a simpler to make adjuvant, and this is really uh, very easy to make, and so this also ties into the fact that, RT, uh, that R21 is available in much higher quantities than RTSS. So protection against malaria is thought to be reliant upon antisporozoite antibodies, and this is definitely, this definitely seems to be the case for RTSS, where you see declining efficacy with declining um, NANP, this is the repeat uh, portion in the circumsporozoite protein, you see this, uh, this waning in efficacy with waning levels of antibody. So RTSS has uh, 
some efficacy. It uh, showed 74% in children aged 5 to 17 months, so in very young children, but that decreased significantly after one year down to 28 and then down to 9% efficacy after five years. Um, in children 6 to 12 weeks, so very, very young children, and they're really the target population that you want to protect from malaria, uh, the efficacy started off at a lower uh, percentage and that waned even further than the older age group. The protection is short-lived and um, appears to depend on the, on the intensity of transmission. If you combine that with seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis, then you get a higher efficacy. So what we want to find in any vaccine is a correlate of protection. You want to be able to find a quantitative le level of an immune response that is easily measurable, that is indicative of protection, and it needs to be a robust predictor of protection. Uh, this is not always the same as natural immunity, so if you just don't find uh, robust protection in the, in the population, you want to find some other way of inducing protection that maybe isn't uh, what you would find in, in the population in general. And this correlative protection, this, this uh, thing that we're looking for, it's really important to direct next generation vaccine development. If you find something that could be used as a proxy for protection, you can then go into a smaller number of individuals, find that protective level and say, yes, we've got that level, we're above that level, therefore regulators in general are more likely to um, view kindly uh, a vaccine development program that has reached an already validated level using a correlate of protection. This is also really important for epidemiological studies where you go into a population, measure this easily measurable immune response and you find out what proportion of the population has waned below that over a certain period of time and that gives you a good indication of when you need to boost and give another vaccination. So, RTSS vaccine-induced correlates of protection. It's not completely clear that there is one robust correlate of protection. As I said, this uh, antibody level to NAMP, this repeat region within the circumsporozoic protein, is really important. Um, there's a really nice study using this uh, system serology approach. So this is looking at multiple different angles of um, antibodies induced by the vaccine and trying to understand if there are any or a multitude of uh, quantitative measures that could be used together to predict protection. So moving on to R21, this is used in conjunction with Matrix M adjuvant, and it's produced by the Serum Institute in India. As Ahmed introduced, it's a VLP, and it's based on the CSP protein fused to hepatitis B surface antigen. And in comparison to RTSS, it's got much less um, hepatitis B surface antigen. So the idea is that there's less of a distraction for the immune system in comparison to the actual malaria-specific antigens on the VLP. So we ran a phase two trial in Burkina Faso, and one and two year efficacy was reported showing um, really high efficacy over the 75% WHO target product profile. And then we've now, we are now two years into a phase three trial, um, and that paper should be coming out in the next two months, I think. So in terms of vaccine production, um, the idea is to give three doses one month apart with a booster dose at one year after that. The Serum Institute of India have already produced a warehouse full of this vaccine and it's ready to go. Um, the capability is 200 million doses annually and it's approximately $3 a dose. There is an agreement to manufacture in Ghana, which is the first, uh, the first vaccine manufacturing facility. Um, the annual supply of Moscarix, which is the GSK RTSS vaccine, is only around 18 million doses per year, and it's more expensive. So it's not thought that RTSS supply will meet demand. So as an update, last month, um, Ghana FDA approved R21 for use, and that was swiftly followed by Nigeria. 
The WHO are still considering the data and they are requiring 100% of follow-up from all participants in the phase three before they decide on pre-qualification. Um, so as soon as that happens, as soon as WHO pre-qualify this vaccine, then that unlocks funding from Gavi and then UNICEF comes on board to actually deliver this vaccine. So I'm going to just go through some of the early clinical development and the immunology associated with R21. So the first UK phase 1A, this is the first in human, happened in the UK in 2015. And that primarily looked at safety, primary endpoint, and then immunogenicity. And that was after three doses, one month apart. And that was a dose finding um, project. And that was looking at two, 10, or 50 micrograms of R21 with matrix M. So it was well tolerated. There were no safety concerns. There were strong titers to this NAMP repeat region. Um, and there were fewer seroconversions to hepatitis B seropositivity in comparison to RTSS which is what we would expect given the lower um, density of hepatitis B surface antigen on R21 in comparison to RTSS. So that was followed in 2016 by a phase 1B in Burkina Faso. So this was the first time that this vaccine had been into um, African individuals. This was all in adults. Again, this was safety and immunogenicity of three doses and the dose, was decided, the, the dose that was decided upon was 10 micrograms. Uh, that was also well tolerated with no safety concerns and again strong IgG titers to NAMP, again fewer seroconversions to hepatitis B surface antigen. So the following slide that I'm going to show is just comparing Burkina Faso to Kenya and this is just to show the difference in malaria incidence. So we're comparing a very, very highly malaria endemic country in Burkina Faso to uh, Kenya, which doesn't actually have that many cases in comparison. And we find comparable immunogenicity in Kenya compared to Burkina Faso infants after these three doses of R21. Um, so it looks like malaria endemicity isn't affecting R21 in terms of its ability to elicit NAMP antibodies. Uh, we did do a comparison between a lower dose of the matrix M adjuvant and uh, the higher dose of adjuvant resulted in uh, higher antibody titers. So with malaria, we are incredibly lucky that we are able to run challenge studies. So this is uh, a study that was done in the UK in adults where you give doses of vaccine and then you take people to a secure facility where mosquitoes infected with malaria are placed on the arm and they they bite the person and then you follow the person up every day to understand if they get symptoms of malaria or not and then you can understand um, vaccine efficacy in a really controlled challenge situation in completely malaria naive individuals and so in this study we looked at various different groups with different dosing regimens with um, we were also able to do a, a challenge um, 84 days after the first dose and then wait for a time and re-challenge individuals to understand how long that protection might last. Uh, also in RTSS there was a signal that looked like there was better efficacy if you delayed and reduced the third dose. This was serendipitous mainly because there was a safety concern and regulators asked the, um, the developers to put a pause and so there was this delay between the first two doses which, which were given a month apart and the third dose. That was also a lower dose. So we tried to recapitulate this. So group two you can see there was a dose of 50, 50 and then a lower dose of 10 micrograms and group five 10, 10 and two. Um, so the highest efficacy was actually found with three doses of 10 micrograms. Um, the delayed dose, it was associated with a slight increase in efficacy, but it was not significant. Um, we also found 60% efficacy at re-challenge after eight months. So this is long-term protection following those, those vaccine doses. But interestingly, if you only get two doses of this vaccine, then you still have some useful efficacy associated with that.
So this was the first study that was used, um, that used the Serum Institute manufactured version of our vaccine. So previously this vaccine had been made with a, a C tag to help with purification and that was manufactured at the University of Oxford. When we moved to the Serum Institute of India, they had a different production method, so we needed to make sure that what they were producing was the same as what we were producing in Oxford. And it was, um, we also measured this delayed fractional third dose compared to the three doses, and there was this increased efficacy um, in comparison to the standard dose regimen. So in terms of R21 efficacy against uh, challenge in UK adults, um, we didn't find a significant difference between the NANP IgG titers on the left hand side between group two which had the delayed third dose and the normal dose which was group three. When we looked at whether individuals were protected or not after being bitten by infected mosquitoes, um, we found this level of, a, of 1,100 ELISA units, which looked like it could differentiate those individuals who were protected from those who were not protected. This is not perfect. We would not use this on an individual level, but just to say that it does look like there's a signal that those individuals who had higher antibody titers against this repeat region were more likely to be protected in a controlled human challenge study. Next, we looked at avidity. So this is looking at NAMP avidity and also C-term avidity. There was one paper that, um, that suggested that C-term avidity, this is just another portion of the CSP antigen contained within the R21 vaccine, was associated with protection. That could potentially be a correlate that could be used. Um, we did not see any signal between either NAMP avidity or C-term avidity in terms of this um, controlled human infection. So one of the functional assays that we're working on in, in the University of Oxford is inhibition of sporozoite invasion. This is a very complicated, protracted assay where you take a hepatocyte cell line, a liver cell line, and you take one of those um, transgenic parasites that Ahmed was talking about, which has a fluorescent marker. You incubate your sporozoites with this fluores fluorescent marker with your serum or plasma post-vaccination from individuals at different time points. And then you try and understand if that, the antibodies contained within the serum or plasma are able to inhibit the ability of that sporozoite to infect the hepatocyte. You put it on the flow cytometer and you see if there's fluorescence within the hepatocyte, meaning that there is infection, invasion of the hepatocyte with sporozoites. Um, so this is a really, on the face of it, a really useful um, functional assay that you think would mimic what you see in the human body. It doesn't look like there's any difference using this assay between those individuals who were protected in a controlled human malaria challenge and uh, unprotected. So given all that, we still had really, really good efficacy of R21, despite the fact that we can't find a really, really robust correlative protection at the moment. So the phase 2b study in Burkina Faso uh, looked at two different doses of the adjuvant matrix M. So group 1 had the 25 microgram dose of matrix M with 5 micrograms of R21 and group 2 had double the amount of adjuvant. Group 3 was a control vaccine and that was a rabies vaccine. This was also the site that was used in um, the phase 3 clinical trial. Okay, so the Kaplan-Meier graph that you can see on the left-hand side, you can see group one with the lower dose of adjuvant in red, group two with the higher dose of adjuvant in blue, and then the control group is in three. And so you can see the incidence uh, in green, the control group had really high incidence, and this is just natural infection. This is not a controlled challenge study, this is just vaccinating individuals and then, and then counting whether they get malaria in the malaria season. So this translated to 
first year efficacy of 71% for the lower adjuvant group, and over two years that only declined marginally to 67%. For group two with the higher adjuvant group, for the first year it was 77%, and for the second year, for the second year on its own, it was 80%. Combining the first and the second year, it went down to 75 So this is um, very significant uh, for either group, for either group one or two. Um, and reached the WHO recommended level of protection from malaria vaccine. And so it was group two that we moved forward with to the phase three clinical trials, so this five microgram dose of R21 with 50 micrograms of adjuvant. So what I'm going to show you now is some of the systems serology work that I'm, um, that I'm working on at Oxford at the moment, looking in a range of challenge studies. So this is still trying to find a correlate of protection that we can use going forward to understand who is protected and who is not protected. So I've used two studies that were conducted in Oxford in naive UK volunteers who had R21 vaccine. So that's the two top um, studies, VAC65 and 72, and then 55 and 59 were in the UK, again, challenge studies, but having received RTSS vaccine. So this is just a schema of when they received the vaccine and when they got challenged by um, mosquito bite. So here you can see um, this is by vaccine and by protection at day 42, so this is at time of third dose. So GSK, when studying RTSS, found actually that the levels of antibodies that you reach at the time of your third dose are more predictive of protection in comparison to later time points. So we've got day 42, Some one study had uh, a sample taken at 56, so that's why it's 42, 56 on the left-hand side. And then we've got vaccine and protection at C minus one. So this is the day of malaria challenge um, on the right-hand side. And so you can see RT within each graph on the left is RTSS, whether individuals were protected or not, and then R21, whether they were protected or not. And so you can see for both RTSS and R21, there looks like there's a signal at day 42 or 56 um, with higher levels of NAMP being predictive of protection. And this isn't the same at the day of challenge. So it does look like there's a difference as to when you actually sample the person and when you measure that correlative protection. So C term, Again, the same setup of the graph on the left-hand side is day 42 or 56, and on the right is C minus 1. Um, there are some differences between RTSS and R21. As you can see, it looks like there's a signal at this day 42 time point with RTSS, but not R21. And then again at this challenge time point. So this is just to really show you that it's not that easy. You need to really think about what time point you're measuring. Um, and, and what you could translate into field studies, because you don't always know when somebody is going to get infected. You can't necessarily study the C minus one time point. Another assay that I'm looking at is complement fixation. So this is more of a functional assay. This is the ability of vaccine-induced antibodies to initiate the complement pathway. Um, we see differences at this day 42 time point for both for both R21 and RTSS, and this is not seen for R21 at the C minus one time point. Again, looking at inhibition of sporozoite invasion, this um, we have we had incredibly high hopes for this really um, this this functional assay that thought that was thought to be um, mimicking what's happening in, in the human body and it doesn't look like there's very much going on for RTSS and we have very small numbers for R21 but there might be some, um, some signal for R21 in terms of protection and, and not protection. Thank you very much. 
for the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk about the phase three clinical trials. So this is a really large clinical trial in five sites in sub-Saharan Africa, um, including 4,800 infants, half of whom got immunology samples that we are analyzing in Oxford at the moment. So there's a standard perennial site regime and there's a seasonal site regime. So the difference between those two is that for the seasonal sites, we aim to get the three vaccinations a month apart, at least one month before the um, malaria season in those countries. So people had the highest titers of antibodies going into the malaria season. So the, randomiz the randomization was two to one, um, RTS, um, R21 matrix M in comparison to the control vaccine, which was a rabies vaccine again. And uh, there were three age groups. So one of the assays that we're running on these samples is a high throughput multiplexed ELISA using the technology called MSD, which we also use for COVID. And this is up to 10 antigens you can measure at the same time. So very, very useful for pediatric samples where you don't have very much sample. And so we're measuring antibody levels to the full length R21 protein, the C terminus of the, of the circumsporozoite protein, the hepatitis B surface antigen, and this NAMP repeat all in one go. So we get lots of data out of this assay. As I mentioned, the phase three results will be coming out very soon. Uh, there are further trials happening in Mali where we're looking at the difference between a one vial formulation and a two vial formulation. So this is really important if you think about in the field, making sure that there's not so much waste uh, for people to deal with from vaccinations. So this was a randomization one-to-one -to, -one to receive a single vial presentation or the original two vial presentation. And there were no differences in safety. Um, there was also no difference in immunogenicity one month after the three doses. So we're happy to go forward with the, with the single vial presentation. We're also looking at co-administration of, of R21 with EPI schedule vaccines at nine months. And so this is looking at the third dose of R21 being administered at the same time as measles, rubella, and yellow fever. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Stockdale? Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you mentioned that R21 is the current WHO candidate for malaria vaccination, uh, targeting 70% efficacy. Uh, what is uh, the criteria of selecting this uh, uh, R21 to be the candidate vaccine? The criteria of selection of WHO for this vaccine. So I think um, from WHO standpoint, it's not a selection between one or two. It's, it's the more, the better, really. Um, Based on RTSS, it did not reach the 75% um, threshold that WHO have said that they would require. So we're really confident that it will be pre-qualified. The stipulation is that they require 100% of follow-up from 100% of participants, which is really difficult when you're dealing with individuals who move out of area, who may be coming back, but there's a delay and there's also a window around various time points for follow-up. So. Um, we have all the data needed to WHO now, and they're just deliberating. Your question to Ahmed before was, I think, really good in terms of the rush that seemed to happen during COVID, and we're not seeing that here with WHO, and I think it's just quite difficult to arrange meetings with the experts in the field because now we're doing other things, whereas COVID, no one was doing anything else. So it was really easy to convene these meetings, whereas now it does seem a little bit dif more difficult. So I think that's why it's taking longer and it is frustrating, um, but we're really confident that, that it will be pre-qualified. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, kind presentation and comprehensive. Uh, I have questions regarding the ethical point of view 
for the clinical development of R21 uh, vaccine. Uh, particularly, there is the preclinical uh, analysis. Uh, there is no a good candidate of animal model for to ensure that the antibodies formed is protective against malaria vaccine. In, in addition, you have mentioned two items that you have mentioned that the inhibition of sporozyte inhibition is not indicative of uh, protection against malaria. In addition, that you have also mentioned that the antibody avidity is not also an indicator of a protective vaccine. So based on these parameters, how to ensure that I will um, go to the clinical uh, trials for patients or for, sorry, uh, uh, healthy volunteers and administer them this vaccine without ensuring that, uh, that the vaccine is protective and I have to challenge them with, with sporozoids, as you have mentioned. So how can you uh, answer this, uh, overcome this problem? So if I understood correctly, um, I, yes, absolutely. We haven't found a really robust correlative protection on an individual level. However, it does seem, so in the phase two clinical trial we published, there was, there did seem to be a level at which more individuals did not get malaria, assuming in a field trial that everybody has an equal probability of being infected. So we know that NANP antibodies are associated with protection, but we don't have a level on an individual basis that we can say, if we take your blood and measure it for this immune parameter, that you are definitely above a threshold that you will be protected. I think for WHO pre-qualification, this is absolutely not a prerequisite. Mm. It's very, very useful for us to be able to go back to vaccine development and say we need something better, we need to induce this kind of immune response, and so therefore can you, in the development process, try to make a vaccine that will skew the immune response in this way because we think that it's associated with protection. Um, and that's what we're doing but we don't have anything on an individual basis at the moment that can predict protection, and that is the holy grail. Okay. We're working Thank towards you. that. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, do you think we can have uh, reached to uh, an eradication program for the malaria over the time, I don't mean today, after 10 years or even after 20 years. But do you think that it's, that's feasible? Because up to my understanding from Dr. Ahmed Salman, some of the malaria diseases coming to the mice, some others coming to the human. So can we reach to that stage? That's a good question. I think um, there are multiple different forms of malaria, so Vivax, is a real problem and there's not very much funding towards Vivax research. So falciparum is the big killer um, and so the majority of malaria research funding is going towards falciparum and that's not sufficient at the moment for what we need. But we are seeing good reductions in malaria incidents when we really pull together and when there isn't a COVID pandemic. So for example, when you implement um, bed nets and seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis and then you have a toolkit of other things so for example these vaccines that are now coming in I think that we I think we will get there absolutely so one of the things that we're working on at the University of Oxford is trying to have clinical trials where you where you use different vaccines um, focused on different uh, aspects of the life cycle so trying to in conjunction with R21 which um, which focuses on the sporozoite stage, also vaccinate individuals at the same time with a blood stage malaria vaccine and also a transmission blocking vaccine. So if you can then have this array of potential vaccines that you can use, I think absolutely there's every chance that we can eradicate malaria, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, may I have questions regarding the evaluation of efficacy of the vaccine? Yes. As I see, you depends on the level of antibody as a marker for, uh, for this um, indication, uh, the efficacy. But uh, for parasitic infection, the cellular immune response, uh, you didn't take it in consideration? So we, 
Absolutely good question. We did look at the cellular immune response um, in the first, I think, three or four clinical trials, and we basically see very little in terms of a cellular immune response. We have looked at um, B cell induction and T follicular helper cell induction, and we have found some interesting findings in terms of uh, induction of specific responses there, but it does not seem to be, um, protection does not seem to be driven by a cellular response, it's, it's mostly antibody. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Blandine Frank Fayard. Uh, Dr. Frandin uh, will uh, uh, tell us a presentation about development and clinical evaluation of GA2, a genetically attenuated plasmodium falciparum parasite that arrests late in uh, the liver. Uh, Dr. Blandin uh, is um, uh, she's uh, uh, a malaria uh, research, uh, one of the members of, uh, one of the team of ma malaria uh, research group in Leiden, uh, in, uh, which uh, is a center for infectious diseases, Leiden University Medical Center uh, the, in Netherlands. She joined Leiden uh, Malaria Research Group at Leiden University Medical Center in 1999. The focus of uh, her work is on understanding the molecular interactions between host and parasite associated with either malarial pathology or immunity. A major area of interest uh, of her research is to generate live but genetically attenuated parasites that can be used in, uh, to immune against malaria. Her group is also very actively working on methods to enhance vaccine potent potency as well as attempting to characterize mechanisms of protective immunity engaged in, uh, in engendered by these attenuated parasites. Thank you very nice for the uh, introduction. Uh, first, I want to thank Ahmed. It's a very long time history that we had with Ahmed. He did uh, his PhD with us, so it's a great pleasure to be here invited. And also thank you to all the committee of professors that give me the uh, possibility to present uh, the work we are doing in Leiden. So Leiden is a well, small city uh, compared to Cairo, but it's close to Amsterdam for you to locate it on the map. Um, so I'm working in the Netherlands yeah, since uh, 20 years, 20 years of research, and the main focus of Leiden is to work on a uh, wool organism vaccine. So like Lisa presented, they focus on the protein which is on the surface of the sporozoite, uh, but we, we are focusing on trying to attenuate the parasite to get the full vaccine presentation of all the antigen of the parasite, hopefully, or at least most of them. Uh, but of course, it's a challenge because you want to have a parasite that is attenuated enough that it doesn't cause the disease. So from the mass model also, we need that uh, you need to reach the liver to get a very good protection with the attenuated vaccine. So for us, it was a challenge to get an attenuated vaccine that goes to the liver, but then does not go to the blood because then you don't get pathology and also you don't get transmission. But the main challenge is reaching the liver, stopping in the liver, and then presentation of antigen. So we, uh, in, um, no, in yeah, 2020, we uh, presented the first report of uh, genetically attenuated parasite injected to human. Like Lisa presented, we use a clinical model for uh, infection of this uh, attenuated parasite. So it's done in human volunteer, and then it's a strain, of course, sensitive to drugs. Uh, it's very controlled, but it was for the first time a genetically attenuated parasite uh, injected to human volunteers. It was a collaboration with the University of Leiden, the University of uh, Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and then the company uh, Scenaria in the States. Because uh, it, they have the possibility, because if you want to inject sporozoite, the full organism, uh, you need to work with mosquito and you need to extract the sporozoite from the salivary gland of the mosquito. And this uh, company, Scenaria, is able to cultivate, uh, well, cultivate, 
to um, get culture of mosquito and then infect them and then extract the spores right from the salivary gland in sterile way, such a way you can then inject to the, uh, to the human volunteer. So uh, spores white came from Scenaria, were injected in the Netherlands to human volunteer. And then, of course, the big question is, uh, do they get or not to the blood? So are they really arresting? Uh, so the first question was, yeah, G1. So I call it G1 because it means genetically attenuated parasite uh, generation number one. And it was safe. Uh, it was immunogenic, but it was not uh, good. The immunog immunogenicity was just reaching 12% of protection. And you have heard from the previous talk, the WHO recommends to have 75% of protection. So it was promising, but it was not what we expected. So then we move to uh, the hypothesis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that uh, you see on this slide that uh, the, if the spores right reach to the liver with the early arresters, so first generation of parasite, they go to the liver, they develop for one or two, three days, but they stop afterwards. So the parasite is still very small into the uh, hepatocyte at that stage. So the idea is that it doesn't present enough antigen and also the quantity is not enough to get a good immune response. So we thought if we try to generate a late arrestor parasite, so the parasite that develop very late into the liver stage, so like you see over here, um, then you can uh, prepare the, the, the genetically attenuated parasite pre uh, presenting a lot of antigen in a good uh, quantity. So we said, okay, let's go to the Rodan model to find out which parasite, because it's really easier to genetically modify the rodent parasite compared to the human parasite. So for us, it was an easy way to use the rodent model. Uh, so, no. yeah. so we selected a different gene uh, to say, okay, this is potentially gene that if we delete them, the parasite will arrest late into the liver stage. It was in collaboration with a group in uh, Switzerland, the group of Herzler, because they also had the transcriptome in the liver stage from the rodent parasite, so it was a very helpful tool to find out which genes are expressed during the liver stage. Uh, and then we used the same uh, model as uh, Ahmed presented with uh, bioluminescent parasite, and then we can see does the parasite go to the liver, yes or not? And then we can check in the blood of the mouse to see if the parasite is able or not to get to the blood. So we did a lot of screening, more than 20 mutants, and we found only one gene, which is the Me2 gene, which is involved in meiosis. So like Ahmed said, you have one sporozoite, they go to the liver and they produce like 50,000 meiozoite. So it's a huge multiplication stage for the parasite. Um, and then this gene, may 2 is, is involved in meiosis at that stage. So it makes sense that if you knock out that gene, uh, the parasite arrests into the liver. Um, so that was, that was in the rodent model, but okay, the big question is, does that work or not in the human parasite? So we moved to the human parasite uh, that we genetically modified. And then for the first time, I guess you heard a lot about it, we used the Cas9 uh, strategy, editing strategy, to knock out the Me2 gene from the human parasite. So uh, we did that, and then we look in vitro using infection of hepatocyte to see if the parasite, uh, yes or no, develop into the liver, uh, well, into the hepatocyte, and if it does, uh, does or not uh, develop for a long term. So you can see on this factor, so all, during all my talk, the genetically attenuated parasite generation two would be in orange, a bit the dust color, right? Uh, and then you see that uh, the second panel, uh, indeed we see the nine development in uh, vitro. So in the human, the, the parasite developed from seven to nine days into the liver before it reached to the blood stage. So we had a Me2 human parasite that was developing into the liver stage. But the main question is, yeah, do they know, yes or no, go to the blood? Because before you get to a naive volunteer, that's something you want to make sure of. So for that, we use the humanized mouse model that we have now to our uh, disposition. So this is mouse I've been 
uh, yeah, immunocompromised, so they can have a human part of the human liver uh, and graft into uh, their body. Uh, but then you want to know if it goes to the blood or not. So what we do is that we use this humanized mouse, we inject one million of wild type spores white, or one million of our genetically attenuated parasite generation two, GAP2, two, GA2, and then they go, they develop into the liver, but then, uh, as Ahmed said, the rodent parasite cannot infect uh, the human. So what we do, we remove the blood of the mouse and then we repopulate uh, the mouse blood with human uh, red blood cell. So then the parasite can move from the liver into the blood stage uh, if he, well, if he can do it, right? If it's wild type for sure, attenuation, we don't know. Uh, so we did in collaboration with the group of uh, Brandon Wilder in the US. Uh, in Leiden, we don't have this uh, humanized mouse model, so what we had to do, and it was just before the pandemic, we shipped our infected mosquito from the Netherlands to uh, Oregon, to Portland, to do this, uh, this test. So it was for us, we didn't know if the mosquito would survive this overseas trip, but they do very well, they are quite uh, happy. And uh, Brandon could do this uh, extraction of one million spores white injection into the humanized mouse model, and then collection of blood to see if the parasite was in the blood, yes or no. So this is what we uh, were happy to see, is that uh, the blood was collected from the humanized mouse, shipped back to the Netherlands, and then we can look, uh, put them in, in a shaker culture, so refreshing with blood cell, like it would happen in our human body, and then we can look if there is the, the parasite or not into the blood of the uh, in vitro culture of the parasite. And you can see with the wild type parasite, day seven, we see plenty of parasite in the blood. With our GA2 attenuated parasite, we culture the blood for 28 days, and we could not detect any parasite into the blood. This was also done by uh, QPCR to make sure that there was no trace at all of the parasite. So we have a GA2 parasite that arrests in the liver using the mouse mo model, there is no blood infection, but of course you want to know what is happening in the real human body. So for that we do what Lisa presented, this controlled clinical trial for malaria. Uh, but before we could do that, we had to ask the ministry uh, of environment of the Dutch uh, government to have the permission to use this humanized yeah, genetically parasite in a, in a Dutch volunteer. So we had the primary clinical data that shows that there was no blood infection, so that could be safe. But of course, as I told you, we use Cas9, so we had to make sure that the deletion was correct. So in the Netherlands, you can use genetic, like uh, the plasmodium parasite, but no other um, DNA should be in the, in the parasite genome. So for, for sure, we use selectable marker, we use Cas9, so we had to make sure that there was nothing of this uh, element anymore into the genome. So uh, together with the group of uh, Anapan in, the Nether in um, Saudi Arabia, uh, we do the complete sequence of the genome of our GA2 parasite to make sure that there was no rearrangement and there was only the deletion of Me2. And then you get to human volunteers, so you have to make sure that your parasite is sensitive to all malaria drug. And it was the case. So then we asked permission to do this, uh, to use this parasite in the Netherlands. And then we asked permission to do a clinical uh, control test with the malaria parasite. So that was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Meta Rustenberg and uh, Matthew McCall in the Hartford University. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, and then we have a first phase, safety and tolerability, because now we go far into the development into the liver, so we want to make sure that the parasite was safe. And then we want to compare, of course, the efficacy compared to the first generation of the parasite. Is it better to go uh, to late stage development? The first test, we used the spores white extracted by Scenaria, but it was really a um, I mean, long-term process and costly, so we said, okay, let's just use the mosquito to deliver our vaccine as a test trial to see if the protection is better, yes or no. So we did a mosquito bite, first 50 mosquito bites, um, because in the first GA1 trial, we used a certain number of spores white and we wanted to mimic that. So about safety, we did five volunteers with 50 mosquito bites. 
And then, um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, and then this was safe, so we could not detect uh, by qPCR any parasites in the blood. So we moved to 50 mosquito bites. Uh, and again, QCR to see if there was any uh, parasites into the blood. And then um, uh, during all the time, so we watched the volunteer for a long, 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 long time, and we didn't see any uh, sign of any parasites into the uh, blood. So then we said, okay, the, the GA2 looks safe, so let's move to do the real clinical trial to see about uh, efficacy of protection. So this is the way the trial was done. We had three uh, mosquito bites with either the GA2 parasite, uh, the GA1 parasite, or non-infected mosquito. And then, uh, so with a four weeks interval, and then three weeks after that, we challenged with the wild type parasite to see the level of protection. And again, we look with uh, qPCR protection or not. This is the, um, of course, we want to make sure because now you get far to the liver, right, with 50 mosquito bites, so inject quite some parasite. So for the GA2, we were a bit, um, yeah, careful to see, okay, you might get, if they really go there and develop well, you might get inflammation from the liver reaction to the parasite. So we really follow adverse event of all the volunteers during, uh, yeah, especially at day five to seven, nine post-infection to make sure that there was no uh, it, yeah, inflammation or reaction to the liver to the uh, parasite. But as you can see, there was no difference uh, on uh, systemic re adverse event between the GA1 and GA2. And you remember the GA1 arrests very early, so you hope that there is no much uh, inflammation there compared to GA2. Uh, but what you can see for both GA1 and GA2 is uh, the, the local adverse event, of course, the skin, huh? because volunteer, they got three times 50 mosquito bites, so you can imagine that some really reacted quite well with this uh, yeah, nice uh, mosquito bite uh, delivery. But now the next question is, of course, what about efficacy? Uh, so is there an advantage, yes or no, to get to late liver stage? And this is what, uh, what the protection outcome gives. Of course, all the placebo and infected mosquito, there were no protection at all, so they all became positive, uh, so 0% protection. GA1, there was only one volunteer protected out of eight, so we had a 12% protection, which was similar to what we had with the first trial with the sporozoite injected uh, sporozoite uh, delivery. And then GA2, yeah, eight out of the nine people were protected. Um, so we were really happy with this result because you get to a more or less 89 uh, percentage of protection. So if you compare all the uh, uh, clinical trial that we done. So with the early gap, there is also a gap. Um, the, the two GA1 we had 12 and 30 percent, so it's very comparable. There is what we call the PF gap three uh, knockout. That's a parasite also genetically attenuated, made by the a group in Seattle by the group of Stefan Kappe. Again, you see that the protection was only uh, 50 percent, but they had even four to five uh, immunization by mosquito bite. And then our GA2 clinical trial, which is 90 percent of protection, more or less. Uh, of course, the next question is, and that was also uh, really pointed out by Lisa, is, is there a way to understand why people are protected or not protected? So we first look at uh, CSP. Um, oh, sorry, this is too far. Yeah. Uh, we look to, at CSP, so the, the, what is the protein that is made for RTSS and uh, R21, the same uh, for this vaccination. Um, and then you see again GA2 is in orange, GA1 is in green, that there was no much difference between uh, GA1 and GA2 with the uh, level of antibody against uh, CSP. You might have the impression that GA1 is better than GA2, but it's just because we had one volunteer that was uh, out of range, so it's not significant. And then we look at AMA1 and MSP1, because when the parasite develops so well into uh, these 50 new meozoites into the liver stage, they already uh, present anti the antigen like uh, for invasion of the red blood cell on the surface of meozoite, 
and especially MSP1 is very is a, yeah antigen sign that there is very well developed um, mirosite into the uh, liver schizome. To a bit our disappointment, uh, we didn't see any difference between GA1 and GA2 with the MA1 or MSP1 title. And then uh, we look, is there a difference between uh, protected, non-protected individual? Um, and here you can see that actually, uh, uh, that the, and the, again, GA2 is in orange, GA1 is in green, that there is no difference. So that it's not that the non-protected one have a lower title than the protected one. Uh, independent of the GA1 or GA2 uh, stage, uh, GA1 or GA2 parasite. So the correlate of protection uh, is not dependent of the antibody titer for CSP or for the uh, blood stage antigen like uh, MSP1 or AMA1. A bit uh, disappointed, but we said, okay, it's maybe a limited number of uh, antigen. So we uh, got in collaboration with the group of uh, Phil Fechner in the US, in uh, California, where they developed these nice uh, tools um, where they have antigen plates on the array, so part of full length uh, protein of the malaria parasites. So yeah, there is 5,000 gene in the malaria parasite, so I don't think they have the 5,000, but they have a quite very big number. Yeah, they have only uh, the main antigen, 250 antigen, uh, and then we use our sera onto this array, and then we use an anti-IgG antibody to see if in the sera of this volunteer there is uh, anti immunoglobulin that recognizes this uh, antigen onto the array. These um, IgG are labeled with fluorescence, so then you can uh, nicely see on the specific spot of the different antigen, is there a reaction or not of the GA1 and GA2 um, sample. And then you get uh, medium fluorescent intensity, high binding, uh, well, a lot of antibody, you get a high signal, or hardly any antibody binding, you have a very low signal. Um, like Lisa said also, it's always very difficult to find out at which time point we can look at production of antibody. But here we decided to um, look at uh, one day uh, before the first immunization, one day before the second immunization, and one day before the challenge. So that is the time point uh, we use. And of course, we have a sample before the trial, and then that's our baseline, and all these uh, Volunteer, sample of the volunteer is compared for a, all these 200 antigen to the baseline uh, data. And then as a first screening, we look at uh, mixing everything together to see if we would see any differences. And that was uh, done by uh, uh, Haja Gopal Murhan in the LUMC to see if we could see that there was any, any differences between GA1 and GA2 with this uh, yeah, looking at this sample at different time point. And then you see that only if you look at the third exposure, then you see that there is a, a main difference. So it, every exposure, there is something happening. But after the third, uh, well, so it, just before the challenge, that one we see that there is a more uh, boost of the immune response and there might be a difference. So this is pulled together, G1, G2. So then, of course, you want to see is there a difference between uh, GA1 compared to GA2. So that's what we did uh, next. So first we look at the, sam at, at the placebo, and then you see that at the placebo there is no difference, and that makes sense, right, because they had not seen the parasite uh, at, after the, the first, the second, or the third immunization. Now if we split up for uh, GA1 and GA2, this is what we get. Oops, sorry, this is one too far. Yeah. So you see that um, at the GA1 sample, uh, there is no much happening, and we take as a threshold, and that's the decision we made, uh, three times difference in medium fluorescent intensity compared to baseline uh, with this area. You remember we have a baseline time point, we should not have any antibody and then you get uh, at a different time point, and then you should see fluorescence. And then we compare always, and we see if there is a three times more uh, fluorescence compared to the baseline, it, it should mean something. 
So for GA1, if we have this threshold, you see that there is no much happening. But for GA2, we clearly see that there is a difference. Uh, so with the blue curves and the red curves, and then you will see that actually, so the more you go, the more the threshold goes up. And you see that with the red curve, there is actually a, a big difference. And that's after the third immunization. So it looks like you have to wait for quite a number of immunization to see a difference. So there is clearly at the antibody level a difference between GA1 and GA2. And then there is quite a clearly effect that also we need to wait to have at least more than one, two boosts maybe to get a real uh, immune uh, response. So then the question is, okay, now we, we know there is uh, this boops of uh, immune response, but to what uh, antigen can that be? So what we do next, uh, we look at the, the uh, difference between this GA1, GA2 on the antibody level. So this is plot, and uh, of course it's uh, it's a selection of uh, some uh, antigens. So on the left, you have the antigen. On the bottom, you have the uh, human sera. Again, GA1 is in green, GA2 is in orange. And I think it's clearly uh, easy to see that you have far more dots with the GA2, so meaning that there is a far more res response to several different antigens of the GA2 compared to the GA1. Most of the, also, well, we have a bit this stranger in GA1 group where we have this uh, large number of uh, antibody response, but you see that most of the response uh, of the GA2 people, their response to a quite large number of antibodies, so GA2 looks to be more immunogenic compared to GA1. Uh, and then we see also, I highlighted CSP, that's again the uh, protein used for RTSS and RTMT1. But uh, in this list of antigen, I, I don't put all the names because for you it would be complicated. But we see that the GA2 parasite actually uh, reacts to antigen from the sporozoite, which makes sense, from the liver stage, and also from the blood stage. So we do have either, I, I did see you that there was no uh, response to MSP1, but we use only a small part of MSP1. So we, we always think that at least with this array data that indeed we do see response to blood stage antigen. So it means that we have prioritistic eroticitic response, but also blood stage response using the wool organism vaccine. Um, so uh, to, to conclude where we are now is that um, we have a GA2 parasite that also, it goes very late into the liver stage was uh, saved, so we didn't see so far any breakthrough. I must say that we, we have a very small number of volunteers so far. I think we have only 24 volunteers that have been tested. So we, uh, we have now a new uh, ongoing clinical trial to really confirm also all this data. We have also shown that uh, GA2 induce a broader response to different antigens. So the more you go to the late liver stage, the more antigen response to uh, more maybe targeting the parasite at the end. Um, and then uh, also, it's not only that it's uh, different to, to more antigen, it's also that the level of response uh, is also higher compared to uh, GA1. So what, where we go next, uh, and that was a question from, one, uh, from the audience, is of course, um, this is only antibody response, and now we target the liver where we should have all the innate immune response, right? So what we go now is to look at the role of T cell um, and then see if there we can see a clearer difference because between GA1 and GA2. Um, it's a, well, of course we can only take blood from the volunteers, so we can only look at circulating a CD8 T cell from previous um, clinical trial study. There is evidence that some of the T cell could be involved, so that's of course what we will look at. Uh, but yeah, it's just the circulating uh, CD8 T cell that we can target. And again, which time point should we look at is always a, a challenge. So now we have a huge collection of samples and we have to make choices to start with. 
uh, yeah, where do we look and uh, which type of cell? Of course, we will look at interferon gamma, CD8, CD4, uh, and that's uh, what is ongoing now. So we hope to uh, have the data for the summer and then be able to publish um, soon after the summer. This is, a, of course, this is the first uh, genetically attenuated parasite late liver stage. Like I told you, there is a group in, uh, in Seattle in the U.S. that is also looking at um, late liver stage development. They have also a, a parasite that is quite similar to our parasite, and they are planning to do clinical tests, so it would be very interesting to find out if they form the same uh, high level of protection, yes or no. So during my talk, I already acknowledge uh, quite a number of people. Um, of course, there is all the clinical team from the two um, medical center, Leiden and, uh, and uh, Eimeren. Of course, we have all our collaborators from the rodent model and then from the humanized model uh, and then now from the antigen uh, uh, looking at discovery. And of course, uh, all these uh, volunteers that went for three times 50 uh, mosquito bites, then plus the challenge with five mosquito bites. Um, and then, of course, I want to thank you for your attention uh, with the Leiden team in picture, if I... Next slide, please. Yeah, oh, no, this is this, the next one. Yeah, that's the Leiden team in picture, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Frank Fayard. And um, if you allow me, because of the shortage of the time, uh, we'll take two uh, questions only. Any questions? Here, please. The mic, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first, I want to thank you for uh, this great talk. And um, actually, I have two questions for you. Um, first, uh, uh, what are the challenges? that uh, you have faced during developing this uh, vaccine. You know, uh, 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 you said that you used CRISPR-Cas9 technique and according, according to our basic knowledge, it's you know, a, a very sophisticated technique in order to develop uh, a, a genetically attenuated vaccine. Okay, um, and my second question is regarding to the ethical considerations. Um, uh, so how these considerations are uh, being addressed and, you know, how the safety of these types of vaccines, genetically attenu attenuated vaccines, um, is, uh, is going to be improved in the future. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, so thank you for your question. So Cas9 is, a, is a, of course, a challenging point, but um, if you can prove that, uh, so the, the Cas9 in our design is not directly integrated into the parasite, right? It's on a plasmid, uh, episomal plasmid, so it, it should never integrate into the genome of the parasite. So we use it as an episomal way to target the May2. Uh, and then, yeah, like I said, if you could, if you could show to the uh, safety officer of the Dutch government that there was no traces of Cas9 by full genome sequencing, we were authorized to use the parasite in uh, human use. So it's not only in the Netherlands, but uh, like um, in the US or whatever, you, we are authorized to use the parasite genome, so to infect people with the parasite genome. The only uh, yeah, rules that we have is that there should be nothing else inside the genome than the parasite. Than, so, but it's possible. And your second question was about? The, sorry? Oh, you mean to, to, to prepare the spores right in the future to have the production. Yeah, that's, that's the main challenge. So now there is only one company in the US, uh, Scenaria. Of course, if, if, the, if the GA2 lo really uh, looks promising with the next one, um, we will try to have an easier way of production of the sporozoite. There is now development of uh, in vitro production, so not going via the muscular stage, but try to have just a cellular uh, enzyme from the, uh, sorry, cell from the uh, midgut to produce the sporozoite. And also the main challenge is the uh, extraction of spores right from the salivary gland, but um, yeah, 
There is also technique of purification that are being developed and we are working on that. So we hope that it will be, but of course it will not be as easy as Air 21. But you can, you know, it's what Lisa discussed. Maybe uh, many ways to go to eradication is a good way to go. So, thank you. Uh, last question. Okay, let me uh, introduce to you uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Awad Tagiddin. Uh, we all uh, know Dr. Awad. Um, he is the president uh, advisor for uh, the health and uh, prevention. And uh, he is also a professor and consultant of thoracic disease, Ain Shams University uh, of Medicine. Uh, he is also, um, he was the former uh, Minister of Health and Population, President of uh, Ain Shams University, and President of the Egyptian Society of uh, Chest uh, Diseases and Thrombus. And Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a presentation and I just uh, about some comments. First of this comments, my thanks, my deep thanks for our chairpersons. <clears throat> also, my appreciation <clears throat> to Dr. Salman and uh, our colleagues from UK uh, participating in our ancient university uh, congress. And actually, we hear today a very strong research uh, to reach, we hope to reach a strong vaccine for malaria. I have a very short story for you. When I was in my office as a Minister of Health a few years ago, I was attending the General Assembly of WHO at Geneva, and at that time they invite Bill Gates to give a presentation or plenary talk. And after he finished, uh, I have intervention. I told him, you put a lot of money from Melinda and the Gates Foundation. You know now Melinda is divorced, but she got uh, millions of uh, dollars. Uh, and uh, he put all of the money for research for HIV AIDS. I told him, you give the money for a disease who is preventable, treatable, and not, not curable. Well, HIV AIDS, up to now. But we have in Africa, as you heard from our speakers, a lot of people died from malaria, not only malaria. We have many other diseases in Africa. We have tuberculosis. We have a lot of viruses and other diseases. Up to this moment, still we are trying to have a stronger vaccine against malaria. But up to now, we have no stronger vaccine for tuberculosis. BCG, is important, it's still it is obligatory vaccines for our, in our country and many countries, but BCG, Bacillus calmate and Georain, it gives uh, some immunity against fulminating diseases, but not preventable disease. So that I advised for him, just in my comment, to develop vaccine for malaria and maybe a future vaccine for tuberculosis. Now, uh, we appreciate the very strong research uh, from Oxford University to reach a solid vaccine for a malaria. Uh, maintaining vaccine acquired immunity throughout life is an important component of life course immunization, definitely. Immunity acquired through immunization may win over time, but can be addressed through booster doses, they are like many diseases, like for example, poliomyelitis. It is necessary to achieve and maintain high level of vaccine coverage to avoid disease outbreaks in susceptible individuals. And finally, it's important to close immunization gaps in populations. We have very major problems in Africa, which was cleared out during the period of uh, COVID-19. Vaccines was available for all uh, uh, countries produce the vaccines, but it was not available for African people. We succeeded in Egypt to cover the vaccination. 
And at this moment, as you know, there is no malaria in Egypt. There is no polio in Egypt. There is no measles in Egypt. And there is no German measles in Egypt. And we are one step to reach Egypt free from uh, hepatic viruses, virus A, B, and C. But we hope to, uh, for the vaccines, for future vaccines, to be available, affordable for the African people. And now we have many millions of migrants from Sudan, from Chad, from Nigeria, from, uh, from Yemen, from certain millions, so that we are trying as much as we can to protect our country from any development of any diseases which already eradicated from our country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now uh, we'll go to the opening uh, ceremony in the other hall. Thank you.